Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of the Live Without Training Wheels show. I'm your host, Lena Sutherland, owner and author at Homeschooling Without Training Wheels, homeschool mother of eight kiddos ages teen to toddler. And I'm so glad you're here because tonight we are going to have a fun chat about homeschool curriculum. And I'm going to show you some of what I've got. And um, I'd love to hear about some of what you're planning to use next year. Let me do a few housekeeping details and then we'll jump right in. First of all, we are broadcasting from a platform called Crowdcast. We're live streaming it to YouTube and Facebook. So if you're watching from Facebook or YouTube, you're more than welcome to stay there and keep watching. But if you would like to join us over here um, in Crowdcast, just look in the video description for the link and hop over and join us. We'd love to have you. Also, um, if you are watching in Crowdcast, you're going to get your best viewing experience in a Chrome browser and on a desktop just because it's easier to or desktop or laptop because it's easier to type. But if you're watching on a mobile, no problem. Turn it in landscape mode. Tap the square in the top right corner to go full screen and then tap view chat and you'll see pretty much what you would see from a desktop. Also, uh, at the bottom of the screen, if you're here with us in Crowdcast, there's a place where you can answer the poll and we've already got some answers to our poll um, now, my question for the evening was, have you finished choosing curriculum for 2019, 2020? And we've got some votes. Uh, nobody says they're not even close. So everybody's either all set or almost or in process. So I'm curious to know if you're here in Crowdcast, answer the poll and let, let us know what your homeschool curriculum choosing status is. Uh, no shame and it's completely anonymous, but it's just kind of interesting to see uh, the lay of the land from folks who are with us here this evening. Also, right next to the poll button, there's a button that says ask a question. And you'll notice that there's already 15 questions, but don't panic. I'm doing things a little differently tonight. That's because um, when I answer questions during a Crowdcast broadcast, I'm able to timestamp the place in the video where I answer those particular questions. And since I've got a whole slew of curriculum that I'm gonna show you in little bite-sized pieces, I thought that I would go ahead and enter all of those curriculum titles into the ask a question window and then timestamp them as I talk about them so that if you're coming back to watch this on the replay, or if you're watching now and you want to come back later and watch it on the replay, you'll be able to open that ask a question box, scan through for the curriculum item that looks of, of interest to you and you know, click the button to hop right to viewing the answer. It's not really an answer, but, you know, viewing the information on that topic. So that's why there are 15 questions all entered by me in the ask a question box. Um, but I'll be ticking through those as I share the, the resources with you. Please don't let that hold you back from sharing your own questions or asking your own questions in the box, because I will definitely still have Q&A time at the end, as I always do, um, as usual. Before I get started sharing curriculum, I want to say a few things. First of all, this is probably going to be a little clunky because I have a huge stack of books on a chair here next to me and another here, chair here to take the books that I've already showed you so I can kind of process through that. And then I've also got um, a bunch of tabs, a bunch of windows open on my computer so that I can share my screen and show you a bunch of stuff. And, and you're just going to have to bear with me and be patient, please, because, um, you know, it's going to it's going to be a little like. Wow, where am I? What am I doing? So I hope you'll um, understand as I as I try to navigate all that. Betsy says we are using Charlotte Mason's Alviary by Charlotte Mason Institute. Awesome. Betsy, is that a complete curriculum for all subjects or what is that? What does that cover? I'm going to show you guys a little bit about layers of learning, which is an almost all encompassing um, curriculum and some really cool things there. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say before I get started sharing curriculum is, you know, I remember when I was um, newer to homeschooling and I would watch, you know, online people talk about what they were getting for their curriculum and I didn't process it well. You're probably wiser and more level headed than I was, but I, you know, I would watch something and I'd go, oh, oh dear, that's not what I'm using for math. I must have picked the wrong one. I need to switch. Why would that? smart, wise online person use that thing. And I'm not using that thing. And you know what? We've used so many different things over the years. And there are many things that I like that aren't in the stack for various reasons. So please, please, please take it for what it is. Just one homeschool mom talking about what she's picked for next year. So, you know, this isn't, I'm not, I'm not the expert and I don't know your children and your family as well as you do. So take it for what it's worth. 
just me sharing mine. And I hope you'll share yours as Betsy did. Continue to share what you're using in the comments. Um, all right, so let's jump in. The very first thing that I want to tell you about is a curriculum that I just absolutely adore. Um, and I want to say right up front that, that nobody has paid. None of this is sponsored. I do sometimes write sponsored posts or um, reviews on my blog, and I am pretty picky about what I choose to review. I only review things that I really love. Um, but tonight is just completely me sharing, you know, what we're going to use next year. So you can ask me whatever you want. And I will, um, as I always give my honest opinion of what I share, but I'm just saying like completely free and open tonight. Um, any question is fair game. Okay. So I am going to share my screen and I'm going to show you a, um, a unit from Layers of Learning. Now, Layers of Learning is a curriculum that's designed by two homeschool moms who are sisters. And I believe between the two of them, they have 10 children. So um, they've got two, each one of them, I think has a child who is already uh, in college. And so they've really, you know, they've, they had the whole spectrum and they designed this curriculum to be used by everybody K through 12. Now, that doesn't mean that everybody is like sitting around the table all at the same time doing the exact same lesson, but it's designed so that everybody is learning the same topics at the same time and at their own level. So rather than just try to describe it out loud, let me see if I can share this window with you and give you a peek at a layers of learning unit. And the one that I'm going to share with you is actually one that's available for free on their um uh, on their website. So, you know, I'm not sharing anything that you couldn't get for free yourself by going to their website. Um, this is Layers of Learning Year One, Unit One. I hope you can see that. Okay, it says I'm sharing my screen. Okay. Um, so this is um, the way that Layers of Learning is designed is that it's divided up into four years so they, you know, you go through the four years worth of material and then you can loop around, um, you know, and, and do it over again with your with your kids as you go through. And you're going to see how you can kind of go deeper and deeper into it each time you go through. Um, each year is divided into 20 units. And um, sometimes when you hear unit, you might think unit study like. We're going to study ancient Egypt and then everything is going to match up with ancient Egypt. We're going to do math and science and everything is like ancient Egypt. That's not really how they've done it. They just call their their little chunks of learning units. And each unit includes four topics. It includes a history topic, a geography topic and a science topic and then the arts. And the arts encompasses all kinds of things like um, art, art history, poetry, music, music theory, like all, all of the things that would fit under the arts are going to be in that category. And so you can see that this particular one, the four topics that they're covering are Mesopotamia, maps, planets, and cave painting. So Mesopotamia is the history, maps is the geography, planets is the science, cave paintings is the, um, the arts topic. Okay, and these are the sisters, Michelle and Karen, who've written this curriculum. Now, each layers of learning unit begins with, this is my favorite, a huge um, reading list. And you can see that these little icons, yellow is like first through fourth, green is fifth through eighth, blue is ninth through twelfth. And then they have what they call explorations, experiments, um, expeditions, and explanations, Um to go with each one. Okay, so for example, unit one, our, our history topic is Mesopotamia. So this box right here is the library list for history. And you can see these little circles will show you, like, so for example, this one is yellow and green and blue. So that would be appropriate for all ages. This is yellow for little kids, yellow and green, you know, another yellow, green and blue. Down here is blue. Um, so you could use this list to get a variety of things, depending on, you know, how many um, children you're teaching and what ages and, um, you know, what, uh, you know, level they are. And, and you don't have to necessarily go by those ages. If you have an older child who needs to read something, you know, of a um, written to a younger level or, you know, a younger child who can read something more complex, you know, you can go based on this list. Let me hop over here for a second. Let's see. Uh, Betsy says, I still need to come up with a German program and finance curriculum for an eighth grader. If anyone has ideas, 
Rochelle says, Cherrydale Press has a great Charlotte Mason-based language program with German as an option. Um, Mimi says, this curriculum makes happy families. You should totally try it. I agree, Mimi. Rochelle says, sorry, I'm listening in, but when does the autopilot for large families begin? July. So I have um, one, you know, tonight's live video. I have one more live without training wheel show the following Tuesday, a week from tonight. And then after that, we go underground. And the live without training wheel show will be only for those who are in the large family homeschool planning group. So you still have time. Okay. Um, so once you've got your book list, so here's one for history. Here's the book list for geography. Here's the book list for science. Here's the book list for the arts. Then you get into what's called the, um, the explorations. Okay. Now I did a little thing, which I'm going to show you because you can do this with any PDF that you're using. And I do this with my layers of learning, but you see this little yellow box right here. Well, you can add comments to your, um, to your, like, I don't have a paid version of Adobe. I just have the free Adobe reader, but even so you can add a comment. And so I've added this comment that says history Mesopotamia. And you might wonder like, well, duh, that's what it says there. Why'd you need to comment? Well, look at this. If you open up the comments on the document, it'll show you all the comments that I've made. And so I made a comment for library lists. And if I click that, boom, it takes me right to the library list. If I click history, it takes me right to the history, geography, maps, and globes science planets, right? So I kind of use those comments as like bookmarks. So I can hop right to the first page of each of those sections by just clicking on the comment. So basically all I did was type a comment that was like the title of that page or section. So I could hop right to it in my PDF. And then I saved the PDF with those comments in it. So they're all um, organized and I can hop right to it. Okay. So let me just really quickly show you what a lesson looks like. So for example, um, the the comment, the uh, explorations for history. And you'll notice all the stuff in the column, in the side column is just fun facts. So like this says, fabulous fact, the Fertile Crescent is a region in Western Asia. It is situated between the mountains of Arabia to the north and the Arabian desert to the south. Mesopotamia is the, is only the, Mesopotamia is only the area around the Tigris and Euphrates River. So it's just like little tidbits, little fun facts here in the columns, which is part of why it's called layers of learning, because there are all these, you know, you could go a layer deeper if you wanted to, you know, you could read something on the sidebar and then like hop over to YouTube and jump off on a rabbit trail if you wanted to. So there's some, te there's some text here that gives you background on the topic. And then you're going to have all these explorations. So here, this is exploration map of the Fertile Crescent. And you can see that it's got yellow, green, and blue by it. So this is something that any age could do. One of the things that I super love about this curriculum is it definitely has the like decoupage, um, you know, sugar cube, um, you know, science experiment kind of stuff going on. But it also has stuff for moms like me, which are, um, so one of the things I that I made a comment on was printables. So if you come down here, you'll see that it's got, um, maps that you can print out, right? So I am not super crazy about like big messy crafts and projects. And I try to move out of my comfort zone and do those some, but I'm also really thankful that each of these units includes things that I can print from my computer, right? So all of these are included right there in, we did this one. It was so fun where I live, right? So they cut this out and they show their planet and then their, um, I think, continent or province, solar system. I forget. But anyway, it's like a little flat book and the pages get shorter and shorter as you go through. So you you kind of are zooming in from your your um, planet to your country, to your state, to your city, to your house. Anyway, that was a really cool one. And it was so simple because all I had to do was print it and provide like crayons, colored pencils, scissors and stapler. Um, and they really enjoyed that. So you can see that there's a whole variety of activities. Um, and again, you can do you know, the, the things that are a little more involved and that include more, um, you know, like we, well, we also did this one, actually, that one wasn't too difficult, making salt dough and practicing cuneiform um, and, and seals. We used, um, I think we used soap to carve um, designs and then stamp them. So, you know, just a whole list of ideas. And the thing that I love, love, love about this is that it's very, um, there's no possible way you could do it all, right? Like you just couldn't. 
And so it's not designed where you feel like I have to check all these boxes. It's like a buffet, right? So you you say, okay, good. Somebody went through and organized all of this for me. So I already know what um, you know topics I'm going to cover and in what order and which things are going to be grouped together. And all I have to do is pick a couple of things to read or a couple of activities to do with each one and then move on. Because you know what? We're going to rotate through this in a couple of years and I'll have a chance to do over again all of those you know, things another time. So, um, it's just, it's just been wonderful. It's been, um, it, it's almost like having Pinterest boards for each topic that you want to study, except somebody has already laid out the order of everything and the, um, you know, and the, and the, each Pinterest board has like a nice selection of like, not crazy difficult. They're not like Pinteresty, you know, they're, they're like, uh, things that you could probably do with stuff you have around the house or you could print out and there's a variety for a variety of ages and for a variety of like, um, you know, levels of mess comfort. So anyway, I just cannot say enough about this. And if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them or you can always contact me some other time or you can look for the Layers of Learning Facebook group because Karen's always in there and um, she's fabulous about answering questions too. So um, let me show you really quick the... Um, the layers of learning. Can you see it on your screen? Okay, good. I pulled it up. This is the layers of learning um, units at a glance, just so you can see how it's organized. So the first one, you know, Mesopotamia, maps and globes, planets, cave paintings. And then the next one, Egypt, map keys, stars, Egyptian art. So you can see that for each of the first, you know, year's units, there's four topics. And then you go into year two, and there's four topics for each one. And so with this PDF, you can take any curriculum you want. And actually, Karen and Michelle have already done this for a lot of curriculums. Um, so, for example, let me see. Um, hold on. I think I have one for Story of the World. They've gone through a lot of, um, here we go, history correlation chart. A lot of common curriculums that you might use. Um, so, for example, if you use the Usborne Internet Linked Encyclopedia of World History, or if you use Kingfisher History Encyclopedia or Story of the World. So they've gone through and correlated all of those with their units. So, for example, we've been using Story of the World as you know one of our history resources. And so you can go through and like, OK, we're studying ancient China. That's going to be chapters 10, 32 and 33 in Story of the World or whichever history curriculum you're using. So it's. It's fabulous. And that's what I'm going to be spending some time on this summer is going through and doing something like that for some of the things that I've picked that aren't necessarily on the chart. I would just want to kind of divide it up and make notes like, okay, this is going to go with this unit. This is going to go with this unit. So, okay, now I want to hop over and show you one more um, layers of learning tool. And this is their writer's workshop. Let me see what's the best way to show you this. Okay, I think I need to close this. Bear with me. Okay, there we go. Okay, so they have a brand new program. And this is brand new in the sense that it's brand new to the public. But this is actually something that Karen and Michelle have been doing in their homeschools for a long time, these little writers workshops. And they've just this year made them available, you know, like, you know, created a curriculum that they could publish and sell so that other folks could use them as well. And I have not used these yet. So I'm just sharing these as something I'm excited about. I don't know a lot about them. I'll be happy to tell you what I know if you've got questions. But um, the idea behind them is this. So Karen um, kind of started this and Michelle has been doing it too. But the way she teaches writing in her homeschool is that each month she teaches a different genre. So she might be teaching like letter writing or, um, you know, in, an informative paragraph or essay or, um, you know, a persuasive, a persuasive piece or a, a biography or a, some, some different genre. And then coupled with that, she's got some kind of grammar or literature um, topic that she's working on. And so she does her writing teaching in these little mini writers workshops. And so this curriculum as you can see, it's super cheap, like five bucks for each of these. So you're going to start out with the guidebook, which just helps you as a mom to understand how writer's workshops work. Then 
she's got this one called Writer's Workshop Jump Start, which is what they do every year at the beginning of the school year. They do a jump start, like a, you know, here's how, um, to like to get the kids on board too. Like, here's how writer's workshops work. Here's what we're going to be doing each month. Like, let's all get on the same page about this. And then she's got a couple of genres already published for you. So this one's called descriptions and instructions. This one's called sentences, paragraphs, and narrations. And so what you do is once you've, as a mom, read and understood the guidebook and it's quick read, it's not like a, you know, chapter book or anything. And then, you know, you do the writer's workshop jump start with them like the first month back to school. And then each month after that, or you could take, you know, more or less than a month, depending on what you want to do, then you can choose a genre to work through with them. And then, you know, you've got a guidebook to go with each of those to, you know, to just kind of spell it out for you. Like, what would it look like to do a little writer's workshop on each of these? And again, these moms have kids that span the ages. So these are designed to be, you know, done with everybody, but you know, leveling the, um, the assignments and expectations for, um, for each age. So I'm super excited about that. I've read the guidebook um, and I'm looking forward to digging in more as I do my homeschool planning in July to each of the, um, the genre books. And Mimi says that there actually is a Pinterest board for each unit um, of layers of learning. And she's right. So they actually do have Pinterest boards where they've collected more um, ideas and activities to go with each of their units. So that's fun too. Okay, let's see. Um, and I forgot <laughs> to mark these as I did them. Layers of learning we did and writer's workshops we did. Okay, so um, they, uh, yes, and they have a YouTube list for each unit as well. Yep, that's right, Mimi. Okay, so even though we're using layers of learning as our, our kind of framework, um, I've collected some resources to use inside of the layers of learning framework, especially because I've got a variety of ages. And so I want to have things that are going to be for older kids and younger kids. Um, and one of the things about layers of learning is that they do um, they do science instead of like, you know, taking a whole year to do biology and a whole year to do um, chemistry and a whole year to do physics or physical science or um, whatever they they study all four subjects each year. So each year you're going to get some biology, some chemistry, some some uh, physics or physical science, and then some, um, what am I missing? I guess earth science is what they call the other one. But anyway, but they're doing it in, you know, it's not just like four random selections. It's, you know, a group of topics that go together from each of those uh, threads of science. So by the end of four years, they've covered, especially like at the high school level, at the end of four years, they've covered all that they need to of each of those sciences, but you're going to be doing some of each one each year. So that's why I've chosen some other, um, other resources to go with it. So um, I was blessed to get, let me close this. Hold on. I told you this is going to be clunky. Where are we? Okay. Um, so at the Use Curriculum Sale at our homeschool convention, I went and got all of the um, high school science books from Apologia. And I'll I'll tell you why I did that. Um, this is the biology book. I didn't bring all of them with me. But um, I got the Apologia books used. And I, at this point, I haven't picked up any of the extra resources like the tests and all that stuff. Because um, a couple weeks ago, they had a sale on their um, their MP3s, like their audio recordings of the books. And my oldest loves science, but he's also dyslexic. And so it's been challenging for him to do traditional science assignments, like read this chapter, answer these questions. And so we're working a little bit outside of the box with him on that. Um, so I have the audio recordings to all of the books. And I really only needed the textbooks themselves in order to, you know, because there are diagrams and things like that in there. So he's going to need to, um, you know, like listen, but read along as he listens so that he can see the, um, the diagrams and all that. Now, I don't know for sure that I'm in love with Apologia High School Science. I haven't used it. 
Um, you know, I, again, I haven't used any of the resources that go along with it, but my reason for choosing it was partly um, because of the audio that goes along that I could get to go along with each one of those. Um, and then also Apologia does have younger kids. Um, you know, this is for like upper elementary or middle school. And so I do have a couple of these that I'll be giving the younger ones. And when I say younger, I mean like maybe my, um, my fourth and sixth graders to read on their own. I also have, um, this is one of the things that was recommended by the Layers of Learning Gals. This is called Head First Physics. And it's, um, it's a physics textbook or a physics, um, I guess you could say workbook. But it's really, um, it's, it's supposed to be more conversational. Again, this is not something we've used first. I'm just sharing with you what I've picked up for this year. Um, but it's like a lot of pictures and diagrams. And, um, you know, if you read it, it's more like, okay, so imagine that you're doing this and what would happen and why is it that that happens? And how could you make this happen or that happen? Um, I've also got a few books for my younger ones from Real Science for Kids. And I don't know if you've heard of them or not, but they have, um, you know, similar, uh, you know, divisions of science, chemistry and, and um, physics and biology. And they're super colorful and they're full of a lot of, you know, diagrams and references and stuff like that. So again, I got those at the used curriculum sale at our homeschool convention, which was fabulous. Um, oh, I've also got, okay, so here's one of the things. With the layers of learning, I have been trying to do everybody all together. And um, it's been okay, but I've realized over time that um, the older kids, especially my, my uh, son who's going to be in ninth grade and my daughter who's going to be in eighth grade, they are getting a little old for some of the stuff that I was doing with, with all of the children together. And it was not only was it a little bit like eh, for them, but they were also getting um, the younger kids or, or when I say younger, I mean, like, for example, the fourth and the sixth grader were um, enjoying what we were doing, but feeling a little awkward about doing it in front of the older two who were kind of like acting like they were too cool for that. So for example, um, when we would sing stuff, they, the older two were like, eh. and then the two children below that were like feeling awkward because even though they enjoyed it, they felt like they weren't cool for enjoying it. And, you know, it made it kind of awkward. So, um, this upcoming year, my older two are going to be going off and doing more independently. And I think that that will free us up to do some stuff that the, you know, two just younger than that would still really enjoy. Um, especially if they don't have the older kids around. So, we did, um, we used to do more of this, but um, we are going to start doing some more with lyrical science. I don't know if you've ever seen those or used those. Um, we've got a few books in the series. There's lyrical life science. There's two different books in that um, set. And then there's lyrical earth science. And they're just fun, cool songs. They come with CDs um, and they come with the lyrics and then a whole, um, you know, description like that you could read aloud about the topic that you're studying. And as I said before, we did those before and the younger kids really enjoyed that. And I think the older kids are just getting a little too um, old for that. They're not, they're not as interested anymore. I also have um, Usborne Science Encyclopedias, and these have been a great resource to go along with our layers of learning. And again, you really don't need all this stuff to go with layers of learning. I mean, it's not like Layers of learning isn't a curriculum in and of itself, but the thing I love about it is that it enables me to, you know, um, thread in all of these resources that I already have that I love, that I wanted a way to, um, you know, to make use of and to, to plan for. Okay. And then um, as far as history goes, I mentioned earlier that we are using um, Story of the World. So with each history unit, we've been reading the, the chapter or chapters that go along with that. Um, another resource that I love for history is Genevieve Foster. I don't know if you've heard of her or seen these. Um, she has a few. This one is Augustus Caesar's World. It's the one that would relate to the history we'll be doing this year. Um, but there's also like, um, I think 
Christopher Columbus's world and George Washington's world and Abraham Lincoln's world. I feel like there's one more, but I don't remember what it is. But they're so cool because they take the the person whose name is on the title. They really do um, describe that person's life and world. Um, but they start from when that person was a baby and they describe all kinds of things that are happening in um, in life, like during that, like that overlap with that famous person's life. So, for example, um, I think it was when we were reading Abraham Lincoln's world, like when he was a baby, I think it was Thomas Jefferson that was still alive. And it just kind of blew my mind like, oh, I, I think of those two guys as in totally different, you know, eras of history. Um, and I'm, I'm probably completely quoting this wrong. So if I'm getting my history wrong, you'll have to forgive me. But anyway, just it was just interesting to see who lived at the same time, what events that we might not connect with each other are going on at the same time. It just kind of helps you to have a global um, idea of history and of a t particular time period um, filtered through the lifetime of one you know, famous individual. And then also for my older kids, I'm going to be using, um, I'm not really using this. I'm just kind of using it as a resource, but it's the Veritas Press Omnibus um, set. And again, this is just one of those resources that I had on hand. Um, an older mom was finished with it and handed them down to me. And I've loved them. Um, like in theory, I loved them when I looked through them, but I hadn't, I have never used them with my kids. And I did some last year with my oldest too. But, um, Anyway, it, it's just, it, it takes you through, you know, particular great works of literature. And you're also, you know, so you're reading, um, you're reading great works, but it's, it's counted as a literature and history and theology course. So it's pretty meaty and I'm not going to be using, you know, everything in the book to its full depth, but it's, think of it like a reading guide. So, okay, if you're going to read the Epic of Gilgamesh, you know, here are, it's got a great like background introduction to all the books, discussion questions, um, project or writing assignment ideas to go along with that. So I'm just going to be using that as a resource to help me to create assignments for my oldest to, um, with their literature and history readings. Okay. Now, um, math on the level. Let me tell you about that really quick. So I started using math on the level a couple of years ago. It's a pretty cool curriculum. I've got a whole video all about math on the level, so I won't go in deep here. But the idea is that instead of, you know, a grade level for each person, um, you can use math on the level for everybody up through the end of pre-algebra. So in other words, everything that they'd need to know in order to be ready for algebra. And there's a cool little, um, like a chart where you can keep track of what everybody's learned and you don't need to go, you know, you don't need to do first grade for this person, second grade for this person, third grade for this person. Instead, you can just say, okay, let's all work on um, Roman numerals or let's all work on, um, you know, multiplication facts or whatever. But, you know, you can keep track of to what level everybody's finished things. And um, there are some skills that kind of drop off once you've so for example um when you are when you are learning one digit addition you'll be practicing that until you get into multiple digit addition then you don't need to practice one digit addition anymore because that's you know contained in the practice of multiple digit addition so again this is a super short explanation of a more complex curriculum but you can see with the uh, with the chart that shows you, and these are, you know, when you've mastered these skills, then you'll drop practicing that skill there. And it also comes with books that help you to explain each of the concepts. So I just brought one of them with me tonight. But for example, this is the book on fractions. So if you want to teach fraction concepts, and this, by the way, is a great resource, even if you're using some other math curriculum. If you just want a resource that will help you like, okay, how do I teach adding fractions? That's complicated. What, you know, what would I do? Then you can find um, the, the topic in this book where that's covered and it'll give you great ideas for how to explain it and, um, and visuals and things like that. So you can walk through it with your kids. 
And there's also a whole nother book about exploring these math concepts in real life. So like, um, you know, with, uh, with shopping or games or cooking or um, other, you know, projects and activities you can do to explore math. Now, the thing that my kids really are using as the spine of their math program is teaching textbooks. And I'll show you that in a minute, but where I'm using math on the level as a way to help expand and deepen their, their understanding of math, their exploration of math. Teaching textbooks, I feel like, is a good resource for, um, you know, making sure all the boxes are checked, making sure all the bases are covered. Um, you know, so if you're feeling like, hey, what should a third grader do? What should a fifth grader do? You know, did my kid do everything that they should do in pre-algebra or algebra or, um, you know, teaching textbooks is really good for that. I wanted to have an, a way to um, just stretch and expand and add a hands-on component to their learning as well. So these are the math on the level things are things that we're going to be doing with everybody like sixth grade and down um, during kind of like a morning time. We call it table school. Okay. And then let me go ahead and show you teaching textbooks real quick. If you're not familiar with this, um, I can answer questions or show you more later, but I'm just going to give you a very brief overview right now. Teaching textbooks is completely online. Um, it used to be that you could purchase um, discs, like, you know, CD-ROMs. And I, I believe you still can, but the main way that they now sell it is through um, an online service. And I got to tell you, it's such a fabulous deal, especially because they have a large family plan. So if you have between four and eight students who um, you know, our math, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm losing my train of thought. If you need to do math for between four and eight students and it starts at third grade, it goes all the way up through, I think, I think they have pre-calculus. They don't have calculus. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if they have pre-calculus, but anyway, it goes up higher than we need for next year. That I know for sure. Um, and it's only like $200 for all of your students, up to eight of them. And you can access all of the, um, you know, teachers behind the scenes stuff from one screen. So I can click from one student to the next in the teacher dashboard and see who's completed what and see their grades and take off problems and, um, you know, remove a lesson if they need to just do the whole thing over again. So anyway, this is the third grade screen that my daughter, um, you can see all these C's over here because she's completed everything for the year. This is her math that she just completed. But for every lesson, um, there's a, there's a lecture. So you would, go, you go through the lecture and it actually shows you the, the activities here or the problem that's being worked on. And the teacher is reading it to you. Like you can see this little bar here is the video um, play bar here. So you can pause it, you can pull the bar back and listen again. Um, and so this, especially for my son, who is dyslexic, has been really helpful because he's a pretty strong math student, but like with word problems and things like that, it was taking him, you know, so much energy just to decode the reading, not, you know, not to mention then doing the actual math. Um, Let's see, Kristen says, my son is dyslexic. He has a Learning Ally subscription, which allows him to listen to Apologia and other textbooks. That's brilliant, Kristen. I did not know about that. I'm going to have to check into that. Um, so in teaching textbooks, um, you know, everything is read out loud. There are four or five practice exercises, which don't count towards their grade. And then once they finish the practice, then they go into the actual problems. And with the problems... It will give you, and you can choose as a mom, do you want them to have only one chance to try it or do you want them to have a second chance? And do you want them to be able to see the answer worked out when they're done? And so I tell my children, you know, if you don't get it right on the first try, I want you to try a second time. And if you don't get it right on the first or second time, I want you to choose yes to see how it's worked out. And it will go through and it will work out the whole problem and explain how the answer is achieved, you know, the the right way if they didn't get it right. So you can see that this is what pops up when they're finished with a problem. Um, 
of course, she got this one right. So it says, you know, would you like to see how to do it? Yes or no. And if you click yes, then it'll walk you through the whole problem and how to find the answer. And um, if it's a if it's like a true false question, then they usually don't give a second chance because, you know, you get a first chance, you answer true. No, that's wrong. Would you like a second chance? You know, but um, if it's an open ended question, then they could have a second second chance on it. All right, let's see. Make sure I've covered all the stuff I want to talk about. Oh, we are going to do. Um, so we're going to my my littlest two who are school aged are going to be doing um, reading eggs and math seeds. And those are just two online um, apps that you can sign up for that go through. It's it's kind of gamish um, and it just helps them to review math facts and um, phonics and reading skills. Um, and let's see. Okay. Now let me show you this. I love this. Um, La Classe di Vertita is a really cool curriculum that I found at homeschool convention two years ago. I don't know if this is how it comes when you order it online, but when I picked it up at curriculum, it came in this nifty bag. Um, my, so it's all zippered, you know, in this pouch, everything you need is in there. And one kit contains enough material for two students. And then you can add on extra student packs and you can choose. Um, he's so flexible. I love the way he's got it set up. You can choose to add on student packs with a workbook. If it's somebody who's old enough to, you know, write workbooks, uh, to write in workbooks rather, or you can choose to just have it come with the activities. And so this is what a workbook looks like. Um, this is my daughter's and she's colored it. This is hers from the, the year that we just finished. Um, and you can see it's really very simple, you know, not fancy. And they're just, you know, answering questions and filling out things about the vocabulary words and stuff like that. And then the activity packs. And this is what I love about this program. So, um, for example, this is an activity we're going to do uh, with, you know, making the the flowers where you fold the foil in like an accordion fashion. And then you have this wire. I don't know if you can see it sticking out there. Um, this wire that you wrap them around and you make a you make a flower. Um, but each of the lessons comes with an activity. So it might be a cooking project. It might be a craft. It might be um, a map or something like that. But each one there's an on video. Then there's an audio CD. So during the week, you can be listening to the audio to um, remember the songs and the, and the vocabulary and um, you learn the alphabet, you learn an alphabet song that has one word for each letter of the alphabet. So all that you practice on the CD during the week. And then, you know, you also have the activities and the workbook things to do. So that's been really fun. And he actually offers um, the, the fellow who, who created uh, La Classe de Vertita offers a high school Spanish course, which I really, really, really would love for my children to do. But um, at the moment, it's a dollar issue. So uh, we're, we're not able to sign up for that right now, but I hope that we can do that in the future. Let's see. Elizabeth says, I have a very advanced math student. Do you buy by level or by year? Could he do more than one level in a year for one price? Okay. So um, the first part of the question is, actually, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to add this over here to the ask a question box so that folks can see that. Let me go ahead and start talking about that. Okay. So Elizabeth, the first part of your question is, do you buy by level or by year? So, so far I've bought by year, but um, that's because my goal with teaching textbooks again, it's just checking boxes. And I know that's kind of like a no-no in the homeschool mom community. Like you're not supposed to be just checking boxes, but really I feel like, um, you know, I want us to explore math in real life, but it just helps me to sleep at night to know like, yep, they went through a third grade curriculum and they can do all the third grade stuff. So teaching textbooks is something they do pretty much completely independently. My, um, my, 14 year old who just completed pre-algebra, there were a few times during the year when he came to me and said, I don't know what to do. Um, can you help me with this lesson? And we watched through the lecture together and we worked through the problems together. But for the most part, they're doing teaching textbooks completely on their own. So even though my, so my child who was in third grade this past year, 
She's a really strong math student. And so she finished her teaching textbooks for the year by October um, because she just was like barreling through it and doing multiple lessons a day. And it was really, it was too easy for her. And I don't say that like as a, it's a bad thing. It's just, you know, she was beyond third grade level, but it was okay. Cause I'm like, okay, good. You finished third grade check. We know you can do that. So I didn't try to match it to their level necessarily. Now, maybe if the, if it was the other way around, maybe if she was struggling in math, then I might adjust the level to what, you know, where she needed to be. Um, but I didn't, I didn't necessarily like want to push beyond where she was because I didn't, that wasn't really my goal with the teaching textbooks. I'm, you know, she's doing plenty of other math exploration in other areas of life, but not with the teaching textbooks. Um, now you can only do one year at that price or one like, um, grade level of math. So like this fall, when I sign my children up for our teaching textbooks and we start in, everybody will be in a particular grade and that's the one they get for the whole year. So you can't like have a child do, you know, third grade and then fourth grade and then fifth grade within the year. You could, you know, purchase an additional subscription, but the, the $200 is just for each person to have one year's worth of math, if that makes sense, one grade level's worth um, of access. Okay. Um, so as I mentioned before, I would have loved to have my kids take um, the high school Spanish from the fellow who does La Clase de Vertita. That was not in the budget this year. So right now, what my oldest two are going to be doing is um, Duolingo, which I don't know if you're familiar with that or not. Again, it's an online app and it's free. Um, and it just walks them through um, they're just doing a lot of conversational Spanish. So it's not heavy on the grammar. I don't think that I would count it for a year of high school Spanish, but um, they are a little bit beyond the the singing and the crafts and the things from La Clase de Vertita, but I really want them to take high school Spanish. So I kind of wanted them to have something they could do to continue to, to stay um, fresh with their Spanish until we can get them some quote, real high school Spanish, something that would, would count for a credit. And um, one of the fun things about it is that you can um, like have friends on Duolingo. So my daughter is friends with my aunt and they kind of compete against each other to earn experience points and there's, you know, rankings and all that. So that's, that's been fun for her. She's such a social learner. So that's been a cool option for her. Um, let's see. All right. So two more things. And again, if you've got questions, keep dropping them in. I'm happy to um, keep answering your questions as well. So I do want to say that we're getting ready to start a large family homeschool planning group. I mentioned this earlier um, and Rochelle was asking about it too, but basically we're going to be walking through Pam Barnhill's um, Put Your Homeschool Year on Autopilot, but we're doing it privately in a group that's designed for large families. And I'm not checking ideas, IDs at the door or anything. So, you know, if you feel like you have a large family or even if you just have two kids who are pretty far spread apart and it's hard to do everything with both of them and you need, you know, to figure out how to juggle all that, we would love to have you. The button below my face, the green button that says large family homeschool planning will take you to a page that will tell you all about that. So if you are interested in um, continuing the conversation with me this summer throughout the month of July about large family homeschool planning. Again, we're going to be working through the modules and Pam's um, Put Your Homeschool Year on Autopilot course. So we'll be going all the way from, you know, crafting your homeschool vision, developing unique goals for each child, all that. We're going to walk through all of that together this summer in my Tuesday night live videos will become private events just for those who are members of the group during the month of July. So if, if this sounds um, like something you'd like to participate in, then go ahead and click that button and hop over there to find out more. And then let me go ahead and show you real quick my kids weekly checklist. And this is just, um, it's a really simple chart that I've made in um, Publisher. And you, you know, you could do it in Microsoft Word or in um, Google Docs, or it's, it's really not fancy. I like to add color and that kind of thing to it, but um, that isn't necessary for the function. It just makes it pretty. So this is what my kids 
get each week. Now, my older kids get their own copy of this. The younger kids don't need a copy because they can't read it. But um, this is so, for example, this is my oldest. So this says Luke's weekly to do list. And you can see that there's Monday through Saturday on it. There's a little box up here where I can write the date in. And then um, so what I do each week is I print a copy of these and then I handwrite just a few things in these boxes. Now, these boxes here are all gray. The ones on Saturday are gray because we don't do school on Saturday. These are gray because by the end of the school year, he had finished up his history and his math and we were just finishing up science. So that's why these are all grayed out. I'm going to need to go through and adapt these over the summer to change them a little bit based on what our new material is. But basically, these are chores. These are chores that he does after lunch. And then all of these are his school subjects. And so you can see how I'd have these little um, uh, bullet point boxes here so that I can just handwrite whatever his science assignment is for Monday through Friday and then you know check them off as he completes them. And then I would have done the same for history and math, except by the end of the school year, all we were doing was finishing up science. And then similar for my daughter, Emma, um, she was doing the same science he was doing. So that's the last thing she had to do as well. And then my daughters, Ruth and Robin, um, have a similar setup where they, you know, chores after breakfast, chores after lunch, and then um, their reading and writing assignments are a little bit different, but then they also have math. And then this is the last checklist that I have, and this is the one that I don't copy. It's for Henry and Hazel and Joey. And this one doesn't really have any written assignments on it because their assignments don't change from day to day. They just do a little bit of whatever it is I hand them to do. And I'm not writing it down anywhere because they're not reading what their assignments are. And so that's why I have them all on one sheet so I can keep track. It's primarily chores, what's listed on here, just so I can keep track of whose chores are what and whether they've gotten them done or not. Um, but like, for example, this says reading lesson, reading lesson, reading lesson, reading lesson, reading lesson, because I'm just doing a little reading lesson with Henry. So it reminds me to do that, but it's not like something he needs to um, read for himself. So there's a sneak peek at that. And then um, let's see. Got it. Okay. So, Wow. I managed to fit it all in, in only 52 minutes. <laughs> so those are, I truthfully, I'm feeling a little like, wow, that's a lot of stuff to fit in for next school year. But I know that once I sit down and I start sorting it out, it's not all this stuff for one kid. Um, and once I start mapping out who's going to do what, when, it'll, it'll start to fall into place. That's why I'm looking forward to going through Pam's course again and get my thoughts together, get my ducks in a row. Not that my ducks are ever totally in a row. They really aren't, but hopefully by the end of the summer, they'll be more in a row than they are now. So let's see. Aha, there we go. Okay. So if you guys have any questions about any of the stuff I've showed you here tonight or about the large family homeschool planning group or my kids checklists that I hand them each week or anything, then let me know. And I'll hang out for a couple minutes just in case you've got more uh, questions to ask. All right. Well, I don't see any further questions popping down in the box there. So I'm going to go ahead and sign off for the evening. But again, you're welcome to email me or catch up with me on Facebook. Oh, wait, we got a question. I'm glad I didn't log off too quickly. Are you doing the review questions with math on the level? No. Okay. So thank you for asking that. Um, yeah, I found that to be pretty mom intensive. Now they do have a new, um, an, uh, it's called online five a days where you can go online and use a little question generator that will, you know, print out. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar, the way the way that math on the level works is that you're 
doing this learning together with the children. And then every day they do five math problems. And the five math problems are, it's not like five versions of the same skill. It's five different things that they're doing just to keep those skills fresh, right? So maybe you're doing cooking and you're working on fractions and then their only written math assignment for the day is five problems. And maybe it's like one on, um, you know, one on fractions maybe, and then one on two digit addition and then one on, um, you know, division and then one on money or something like that. And is that four? I don't know, I can't even count. Um, but they're doing five problems and you're rotating through the skills that they practice just to keep them fresh on everything. So it's completely tailored to each child and what they've mastered and what they need to practice. Um, so Elizabeth is asking if I'm doing those review questions with math on the level, I'm not. I feel like if they are going through teaching textbooks, then over the course of their years, K through, you know, eight or seven, whenever they're ready to move into algebra, um, then they're going to hit on all those things. And my my attraction to the math on the level is just the hands-on real life learning exploration bit of math. And so I'm using math on the level just as a way to add some of that to our morning time and to help me get an idea for who is understanding what. Um, but I've I've kind of, you know, handed off the whole practice thing to teaching textbooks. I feel like, okay, teaching textbooks, you're practicing all that stuff. I'm going to, you know, count that as your practice. And I can just feel free to do exploration without, you know, needing to tie it to any particular practice. So for example, last year we did a whole um, unit on geometry. So we just did a lot of talking and exploring and kind of playing with geometry during morning time. And that wasn't, what they were doing in their math necessarily, but it's okay. Cause I knew like, okay, with teaching textbooks, they're going to check the boxes. Um, and I'm free in the morning time then to just, you know, explore and dive deep. And it's still, it's still relevant because obviously they're building the same logical thinking skills. They're doing the same, um, you know, they're exercising the same parts of their brain as they're thinking mathematically. Um, but I didn't have to worry about like, oh, who's doing what in teaching textbooks? And are we all going to be learning the same thing? Yeah, they're checking those boxes over there. And, you know, here in morning time, we can just dive in and explore whatever we want or whatever I feel like would be helpful to do next. All right. I don't see any further questions. So I'm going to sign off for the evening. Next week, I'm going to be back here again. And I think what I'm going to be talking about is how to rock the wrong curriculum. So if you're interested in hearing about what to do when you've picked the wrong curriculum, or maybe even how to choose the wrong curriculum in advance, if you're interested in that, then follow Lynna at Live Without Training Wheels and keep an eye open for um, the Facebook or the uh, email notification so that you can hop on in here and we'll chat about the wrong curriculum. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you for joining us. Hope you guys have a great week and I'll see you next week.